We are opening today with Daniel Colson. Daniel is a senior software engineer on the Ruby architecture team at GitHub. He's worked on Rails applications of all sizes and contributed to numerous open source projects. Daniel was formerly a composer, violist de gamba, gamba de gamba, and professor of music. So it sounds to me like a career changer, which is really cool. How many of us here are career changers? A lot of people. I love that. I just love taking that poll every conference. Sweet. All right, Daniel is gonna take us away and kick us off with a very hungry transaction. Give it up for Daniel. Uh, in, important bit of information before I start. Um, I'm not the only viola da gamba player in the room. I think I see you back there. We've never met in person before, but, but we're the two, so. <laughs> So today I'm going to tell you a story about Cat. Cat is a software developer working on a large Ruby on Rails uh, application at BugHub. And Cat has had a bit of a stressful week. Uh, BugHub is a large online community of bugs, and Cat has spent the past week shipping a highly successful new product within BugHub. Uh, but along the way, Cat has had to deal with a bunch of problems, everything from data consistency bugs, to application slowness, to at one point even site-wide failure. All these problems are gonna trace back to a single database transaction. It's gonna start out as a simple little transaction, but as the days go by, it's gonna grow as there are more and more business requirements, and eventually the transaction is gonna become a liability for CAT's application. Along the way, we're gonna explore what went wrong and how CAT could have prevented some of these problems. The story starts on Monday. Cat showed up to work, very hungry for business opportunities. Cat knows that a lot of the bugs on BugHub are very hungry for food, but they're too busy connecting on the site to go out to the grocery store, sitting there hungry on their computers. They want to have groceries delivered directly to their homes. So Cat has decided to launch a brand new grocery delivery service integrated directly into the larger BugHub product, the first grocery delivery service for bugs. Uh, we're not gonna dig into the controllers or the views or even how this order gets put together today. We're only looking at how the order gets saved. So we can assume that this order instance variable here is an instance of an active record model, an order model, backed by an orders table in the database. An order is gonna have various grocery products in it those will be identified by a SKU or a stock keeping unit. And then finally, there's a join table connecting the products to the order. Uh, and that order item is also gonna have a quantity on it for how many of that particular product was ordered. Although it's not explicit in the code here, when calling save on an active record model opens up a database transaction. So if we look at the queries involved here, we're gonna see a begin statement, that's opening up the transaction. And then it'll insert the orders and some number of order items. And then finally, there'll be either a commit statement if the transaction is successful or a rollback if it's not. So this is what a transaction is supposed to look like. The idea here is we want this to be atomic. We want it to be all or nothing. Either all of the inserts succeed or none of them succeed. We don't want partial success. So this is a good use of a transaction. And there's not too much risk here on Monday. Cat ships this code and all is well. So far. On Tuesday, Cat discovers that bugs are ordering more items than what BugHub has in stock. And this is a pretty frustrating experience. Bugs get excited about their order, then it gets canceled, they can't get those items. It's no good. So Cat decides to deal with this problem by keeping track of the inventory directly on the products table. It's a new column on the products table. Uh, and then Cat can use that information to avoid showing out of stock products on the site, maybe add some model validations along the way. <clears throat> then over in the submit code, Cat adds, af after saving the order, Cat adds this call to update the product inventory for that order. And the exact queries here aren't too important, but the basic idea is for each item in the order, uh, it'll be an update statement subtracting however many of that item was ordered 
uh, from the inventory for that product with the corresponding SKU. And then there will just be a bunch of these queries for however many items are in the order. Cat wants these two things to be atomic. So either the order saves and the product inventory gets updated or neither happens. So he wraps this in a now explicit database transaction. And so now all the inserts and updates are happening together in this one transaction. So that makes sense. This, is, this seems fine, except after shipping this code, Cat starts noticing an increase in 500 responses for placing orders. He looks at his bug tracking software and sees a whole bunch of errors like deadlock errors, lock timeout errors, also requests taking a long time and sometimes timing out. So what's going on here? The underlying problem here is something called lock contention. This happens when multiple processes are trying to work with the same data at the same time and they end up having to compete for or contend for access to that data. We can imagine two bugs ordering the same or similar products around the same time. But their transactions are both going to begin. They're going to insert their orders. They're going to insert their order items. And then both of those transactions arrive on this update statement, both trying to update the product and inventory for the same product at the same time. Well, that's not quite going to work. Uh, I've been comparing uh, database rows recently to bathrooms. Um, it, it really only makes sense for one person to use it at a time. When you go in, you lock the door, and then anybody else that wants to use it has to wait. Uh, so that's kind of what happens here. One of these update statements is going to arrive first. And in order to perform the update, it needs to lock the row, which means that the other transaction is going to get stuck waiting on that lock. Even after the update succeeds, that row is still going to be locked for as long as the transaction is open. And so bug 2's transaction is, is left waiting for a while until eventually bug 1's transaction commits, and then bug 2's transaction can proceed. So at best, contention like this uh, is going to make the performance of transactions worse. You can see bug 2's transaction is sitting there waiting. At worst, it can lead to things like deadlock errors, where you have two or more transactions waiting on opposite locks, and actually neither one can proceed. Or lock timeouts, where a transaction actually ends up waiting so long that it times out, it just gives up. <clears throat> Interestingly, the speed of a transaction is going to affect how much opportunity there is for lock contention. So if the transaction is fast, these locks are not held for too long. There's not a lot of opportunity for contention. The chances of another uh, transaction coming along and needing to operate on these same rows at the same time is relatively low. And even if it does happen, it's, they're not going to have to wait that long for the locks. But if there's a slow transaction, there's now a lot of time for another transaction to come in and need to operate on these same rows. And it might have to wait a while to get those locks. This is what was happening in Kat's case. Kat had a bunch of slow transactions creating this opportunity for contention. But what was making Cat's transactions slow? Well, one thing is Cat had some slow queries within these transactions. It turns out these update statements were slow because Cat forgot an index on the SKU column. Ah, darn. Um, I find it kind of interesting that adding an index and speeding up a query can actually affect lock contention in your transactions. It's not obvious to me. But even if Cat had made all these queries fast, these very hungry bugs were submitting orders with massive numbers of products in them. Uh, and so too many queries within a transaction can also cause that transaction to be slow. Transactions like this are especially bad for contention because they're also holding a, a lot of locks. So if you have, I don't know, 1,000 products getting updated, that's 1,000 locks you're holding for the whole time the transaction is open. And then in addition to holding a lot of locks, a transaction like this is fairly likely to get stuck waiting on locks as well. And so contention kind of has a way of spreading. Locks held by one transaction slow down another transaction. And then that slowness creates more opportunity for contention with yet more transactions. And the problem kind of cascades. So operating on large batches of records is not something a transaction is good for. You can probably get away with updating hundreds of records in a transaction, but if you start getting into the thousands, it might be time to reconsider the design. 
maybe in this case, cat should be validating a max number of uh, products as possible to have in a single order. So this innocent looking addition can actually cause some problems if it causes slowness in the transaction. Cat can reduce the possibility for contention by speeding up queries, limiting how many queries there are. Uh, and cat can also prevent some of the specific errors that he saw, like the deadlock errors can actually be fixed by updating products in a consistent order. But cat might also want to question his assumptions about whether this needs to be within a transaction at all. Maybe there's another design that doesn't require these updates to happen in the transaction, or that doesn't require updating the products table at all. Maybe cat needs a more robust inventory management system that lives outside of this database. On Wednesday, Cat noticed customers complaining that submitting an order was taking too long. They click on the submit button and get stuck waiting for a spinner. Nobody likes a spinner. Well, some people like spinners, but. Cat <laughs> uh, tracked the slowness back to a single after create call. That was doing some slow work like syncing with external platforms, sending out emails, and so on. This is stuff we often don't want inside of a web request because it slows down the request. Uh, we also don't want it inside of a transaction because it slows down the transaction and creates more opportunity for contention like Cat saw on Tuesday. So Cat moves the slow stuff into a background job and all is well? Well, not exactly. It's definitely an improvement, but there's still a potential problem here. After shipping this change, Cat started to get reports of confirmation emails being delayed by several minutes. Since Cat is using an after create callback, the job here gets enqueued right after inserting the order, but that's before the transaction commits. Uh, Cat is not using a database backed job backend. So enqueuing the job here is not part of the transaction, it's a separate operation. And that actually means the worker can pick up this job and run it before the transaction commits. It's not too big a deal in Cat's case because this job requires a persistent order and the order is not really persisted until the transaction commits. Uh, so the job's gonna fail and it can get retried later after the transaction commits. It's fine, not ideal, but it's fine. But then this transaction moves on to updating products, which we've seen can be quite slow in Cat's application. And that actually leaves room for this job to retry and fail multiple times before the transaction commits. To accommodate that, Cat has had to configure the retries for the job rather high so that eventually when the transaction does commit, it will retry one more time and succeed. But all these retries, sort of become problematic when we consider that also a large number of these transactions are rolling back because of these contention related errors. In this case, the job gets enqueued, but it can never succeed because the order never actually gets created. So these jobs get stuck retrying and failing until eventually the retries run out. So these are destined to fail, but they're stuck in the queue using up resources. Uh, and so what happens in Kat's case is these failed jobs ended up backing up the queue, getting in the way of successful job runs and delaying the work of those successful job runs, which included sending confirmation emails. Cat probably needs more job capacity here. Uh, it's, it's not great that these extra retries uh, got in the way of successful job runs, but we want our capacity to be determined by successful runs, not all these extra failures. So the simplest thing Cat could have done differently here is to replace this after create call with an after create commit callback. And that way in queuing the job happens after the transaction commits. And it only gets enqueued if the transaction commits. If it rolls back, it won't get enqueued at all. So now the job will typically run exactly once and we won't need to do any of these fails and retries at all. And actually Cat can look forward to Rails 7.2 here uh, which is gonna come with some configuration to do this by default. So to enqueue jobs after transactions commit by default. And in that case, Cat wouldn't have had to make any code changes at all. He would have gotten this improved behavior for free. So that's great. <laughs>
on Thursday, customers started reporting getting deliveries too late or sometimes getting the wrong items in them. And it turns out Kat's team has been doing a bunch of manual work to fulfill the orders, but it's a slow and error prone process. And Kat has decided to work with an external fulfillment service that will handle fulfilling the orders. This fulfillment service has an API that Kat can use to submit the orders. So after saving the order to BugHub's database, Kat adds this call to submit the order to the fulfillment service via a fulfillment client. And this is an HTTP call to an external service inside of a database transaction. Hmm, yeah. Mm -hmm. If we look at the queries involved where this external call gets made, we might notice it looks kind of similar to the job example. And that's because it is. In queuing a, a job with Kat's particular job backend was also uh, an external call. And so this one has some of the same problems. So for example, this external call could succeed, but then the transaction could still roll back from some reason. So what do we do then? But worse than that, after shipping this change, Kat started to see errors across all of BugHub and not just in the grocery delivery product, this is across the whole site. Looking into these problems, Kat noticed that this external fulfillment service was having some scaling problems. Too many orders were coming in from BugHub and the service just wasn't able to handle them all. It makes sense that that would affect creating orders, but how has this cascaded into failure across the whole site? Well, as the service got backed up with too many requests, it started responding really slowly or sometimes not responding at all, just hanging. Intermittent slowness is somewhat expected for external calls. Services can be slow or they can degrade, but there's also a network we have to deal with and network latency is an issue. That's why we often move external calls outside of web requests into background jobs. But regardless of whether this transaction is in a web request or in a job, when slowness is happening inside of a transaction, it can threaten the health of the database. From the database's perspective, the transaction is sitting idle for the duration of this slow external call. So you might think it's not doing much, but it's still using up valuable resources. For one, coming back to these, these locks, uh, these locks are gonna be held for the duration of the transaction. If your transaction is sitting there for minutes, those locks are held for minutes. That's not the biggest problem though. In this case, what was happening is, uh, and <laughs> I lost my, lost my words here. More importantly here, an open transaction uh, is keeping the uh, database connection open the entire time that the transaction is open. And so that database connection can't be used for anything else. So the fulfillment service degraded, orders kept coming in, opening up a transaction, and then getting stuck sitting idle waiting for that transaction, waiting for the fulfillment service to respond. As more and more orders came in, the number of connections in use increased, which meant the number of available database connections decreased until eventually every single database connection was in use. At that point, no other request was able to acquire a database connection. And so any request needing access to this database across all of BugHub started to fail. Even the connection pooling mechanism sitting in front of Cat's database did not help here because each transaction is using up one real database connection the entire time it's open. This is a really bad problem. One thing Cat should have done differently here is to add a client timeout to this HTTP call. You never want to wait an unlimited amount of time for an external call to respond. And that would have mitigated the problem to some extent, but there's always going to be some risk having an external call like this inside a transaction. And there's no real advantage. This external call has no place inside the transaction. And the solution is that Cat should move this network call outside of the transaction. So now if the fulfillment service has problems, it has no effect on the database transaction. That transaction only begins after the fulfillment service succeeds. So failure of the service will affect creating orders, but it's not gonna affect the whole site. I also like that now it's visually kind of obvious that these are two separate operations, not a single atomic operation. So it's easier to see that 
in, in both versions, it was possible to submit to the fulfillment service, but then have that orders transaction roll back, have it fail. But, but we can kind of see it now. And actually, that doesn't seem like the best failure mode. Like, if, the, if we submit this order to the fulfillment service, it starts getting fulfilled, but then we have no record of it in the Bug Hub database, that could be kind of bad. Maybe if the order transaction rolls back, maybe the API has a way to like delete the order, but that could fail too, so then what do you do? It might actually make sense for Cat to swap the order here. And that's, that's easy now that these are two separate operations and we can see that it's just rearranging, rearranging lines of code. Uh, now it's possible to create the order in the Bug Hub database and then fail to submit to the fulfillment service, but that might be an easier thing to deal with. Like maybe the order has a status on it and the status gets updated after submitting to the fulfillment client and so you can, you can find orders that were created but then never submitted and then retry them or do some manual recovery or whatever. Friday. On Friday, customers started complaining about site reliability. Uh, in addition to all the problems we've seen so far, users were seeing intermittent 500 responses and slow responses, and they're starting to get frustrated. These problems stem from the grocery delivery services popularity. The database is getting overwhelmed by writes on these orders and products tables. So in some ways, it's a good problem to have. Pat meets with the database team and they need to respond quickly and they decide that the best course of action is to split out the orders and products tables into separate databases. But that leaves Cat with a bit of a problem here. This orders transaction has both orders queries in it and also products queries in it. So Cat does this. Uh, yeah. Kind of looks reasonable. Looks like it should work. Um, but it's actually a, a really bad risk. Cat can pretty much expect all the bug reports that we've seen today, but they're all gonna be worse now because they all affect two databases instead of one. So everything inside these transactions, if we have those contention problems, if we have external services failing, that's affecting both of these databases. And then on top of that, queries to one database inside of a transaction to another database are yet another type of external call. And they come with the same problems as any other external call. So we've now tied the health of these two databases together, limiting the effectiveness of extracting them in the first place. <clears throat> Furthermore, after Cat shipped this change, he noticed that certain products stopped selling because the inventory went down to zero, even though the product was actually still in stock. And that has to do with the fact that these two transactions, they're they're two separate operations to two separate databases. This is not a single atomic operation. So probably most of the time, things will work. Like both transactions will commit most of the time. Or if the inner products transaction rolls back, that will probably cause the outer orders transaction to roll back as well. But it's also possible for one of these transactions to commit and the other one roll back. And in Kat's case, that was, that's what was happening. The inner products transaction was committing, decrementing the product inventory, but then that order never actually got created. That transaction got rolled back. And it was actually a more common scenario than you might think. And that has something to do with the fact that this orders transaction is sitting idle for the duration of the products transaction. And after a long period of idle time is one of the most likely times for a connection to suddenly go away. You could hit uh, database timeouts, network timeouts, there's all sorts of things that can happen here that can cause that transaction to roll back even when you might have meant to commit it. So since there's no guarantees here about those transactions being atomic, the first thing Cat should do here is remove the nesting, do them one after the other. That's not always an easy change to make. Uh, but it's an important one for the health of these databases. Again, I like that doing things sequentially like this highlights the fact that it's two separate operations, not a single atomic one. And so we're now more likely to consider the case where the products transaction succeeds and then the order transaction fails. Cat doesn't want the product inventory to get decremented without the order getting created. <clears throat> 
So one thing he could do is swap the order of these things. Although now there's another failure mode. It's now possible to create the order without decrementing the product inventory. So now the inventory could end up too high instead of too low. Maybe that's better. Um, but cat can choose. That's the point here is that he can see that these are two separate steps and choose which one works better. If cat really needs these two things to behave like they are atomic, that's going to require quite a bit more code. It's kind of a, I don't know, I think it's kind of a hard problem. There's various patterns for doing that involving making steps retryable or rollbackable, but I'm not going to go too much into that. That's a whole, whole big, maybe a, maybe a separate talk there. That brings us to the weekend. A cat doesn't work on the weekend. Cat likes to rest and reflect on what he's learned. So he learned this week that external calls within a transaction are a risk. They can lead to data integrity problems because they make things sort of look atomic that actually aren't. And they can lead to cascading failures where failure of uh, an external service leads to failure of a database. And these external calls include a lot of things. HTTP requests, sending emails and queuing jobs, querying other databases. Really the only thing we want inside of a database transaction is queries to that specific database. I also learned that slow transactions are a risk. Slow transactions within a request make for slow requests. We generally don't like those. But really we don't want slow transactions anywhere. We've also seen slow transactions creating this opportunity for contention. Contention ends up sort of affecting places all over your application. Performance of unrelated database operations can get affected. And then there's also this issue of resource exhaustion. Database connections are a finite resource. Database CPU is a finite resource. Uh, and slow transactions may be overusing these resources and threatening the health of the, the database. So again, even if it's a slow transaction in a job, we, we often sort of optimize for fast requests. But even slow transactions in a job can affect the health of your requests as well. So anyway, that's the weekend. Cat had a nice restful weekend. Uh, but it turns out over the weekend, a bunch of other teams were writing code and making changes to this transaction. And Cat came back to this. <laughs> yeah. Who's seen a transaction that looks something like this? Or like at least in length? Yeah, a few, okay. <clears throat> uh, many of us know that big transactions like this are bad for maintainability. Like usually nobody knows how a transaction like that works and nobody wants to touch it. Um, but I think we underestimate how much risk is actually in a transaction like this. It could include the risk of bringing down your whole application. And it certainly includes risks that is affecting other parts of your application. So what can Cat do with a transaction like this? He's probably tempted to crawl into a cocoon and wait for it to get rewritten. But I'd recommend that Cat avoid rewriting a transaction like this from scratch. Instead, it's generally best to improve things little by little, make the minimal change to make the transaction a little bit better, move one external call outside of the transaction, speed up one query. There's some tools coming in Rails 7.2 that are going to make it easier to defer work until after a transaction commits. I already mentioned automatically delaying active job in queues, but there's also a more general purpose callback coming to register work for after a transaction commits. <clears throat> uh, I think this is going to make it easier to do these incremental improvements without totally rewriting your code. Just pick one little bit of code to defer. In addition to fixing this transaction, Cat really needs to identify problems in any transaction in the application. Because again, these transactions can affect each other. Uh, most databases, whoops, I, do you want to restart the system? No, I don't. Cancel, do nothing. Sorry, I hope I didn't break everything. Um, what was I saying? Yes, uh, most databases have tools for inspecting the behavior of queries and transactions. Um, in MySQL, there's a performance schema database, and you can find transactions that are slow, or which ones are holding or waiting on locks, which ones are sitting idle. Uh, and then there's also, uh, we added 
transaction instrumentation to Rails 7.1, it can be helpful to combine that application side information with the information you get from the database. The application side gives you back traces for things, and also you can get timings that include network travel and things like that. And then finally, I'd recommend that CAT try to prevent problems like this from creeping back in. Uh, so there's, it's possible to build tooling on top of the Rails transaction instrumentation, but there's also tools like the isolator gem that try to detect external calls inside of transactions. And I'll also leave you with a few tips for writing safe transactions in the first place. So first and foremost, if you, if you wanna just remember one tip, it's keep transactions short. Uh, I made up keeping them less than a second. Uh, I start to get uncomfortable when I see transactions more than five or 10 seconds now. Uh, I, won't, I won't say how long transactions sometimes get at GitHub, but it's longer than that. <laughs> Having fast transactions means fast queries within those transactions and not too many of them. Uh, I say less than 100, but I don't know. Maybe it depends. Uh, more than 1,000 starts to make me uncomfortable nowadays. No external calls in transactions. There's too much risk and there's no real advantage. Really, we want as little code as possible to run inside of our database transactions. You wanna do as much work as you can before or after the transaction. Callbacks can sometimes make it difficult to see what actually is happening in your transaction. So when you're writing them, uh, it's best to default to callbacks like after commit where the work happens outside of the transaction unless you have a reason where you specifically need that work to happen in the transaction. And then finally, it's worth asking whether you really need a transaction at all. It's often easiest to dump all of our queries into a transaction because it's easiest to reason about, but it's not always the best for our application or for the health of our database. We might need to treat our databases as a more sensitive resource and avoid making it work harder than it needs to. So hopefully these tips will help you write safe transactions and you can avoid some of the problems that Kat went through. Uh, I work at GitHub, not BugHub. I've changed names and domains and species for this talk, but this is all based on real problems we've seen and are still seeing and still working through at GitHub. So I'd be happy to talk about any of that with you. Uh, also like to thank my father-in-law and his friend for doing the illustrations. So thank you.